imagine you live your life, dawah, dedication to the community, and then like, you know, 15, 20 years later, maybe, you know, Allah, obviously he dies from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like there's no Absolutely. guarantee, right? But yeah. imagine you leave that legacy with other people and then with your own kids, your own family, it's just like, they got the yeah. short end of the deal. That's, that's scary. the thing, man. You know, that's why I, you know, I never judge people and cause you just never know. Right. A lot of, there's a lot of imams and scholars and speakers or whatever, and their kids are very far away from the deen. Yeah. And that truly shows us that Hidayah is from Allah. Right. Yeah. You just, you just never know. So yeah, that's true. It's weird but when their wives are from, it's weird when their wives look like they're far away from Islam. Sometimes it sticks out. Like I, I always worry about, like, especially it makes know, like, sense. It makes sense to me, to be honest. Why is that? So I'll tell you why. So, look, when when you look at a, an imam or a scholar or whatever, you know that person. You know their life. You know their development in ilm and knowledge and so on and so forth. You have to understand that people, the people around him, his family, they have their own life, right? Mm -hmm. So, hypothetical, maybe. They both, they got married. Neither of them was practicing. Yeah. He became practicing. He learned the dean, whatever. She just didn't develop in that way, yeah. right? Or maybe she went through some trauma in her life that caused her to go away from the dean. And, you know, he still has to be a, a good husband and mm. responsible for her. And, and so I, I see that all the time. And that's why, you know, to me, I know it may seem odd, but I, I you know, I'm, I, just, I guess I've just gotten used to the idea yeah. Because a lot of families feel like it's families of speakers and scholars, imams. To them, they feel like it's very unfair that they have to live up to these standards that their husband right. or their father has set. And I know I've talked to kids who have like on purpose rebelled because of the expectations from that. Mm. Right? Like, oh, you're the imam's son. You should be like, this. they're like, you know what? Forget you. Yeah. Right? So they'll go in the other direction. They'll purposely like rebel. You know, they always say like the preacher's kids are the worst. You know, you hear about that sometimes. Like, <laughs> You know, in like in like the you know Christian world and stuff, you're like the uh -huh. son or daughter of the preacher, and then definitely there's probably a level of resentment they might have. Like this yeah. this community has taken everything from me. Like I don't even have a dad because of you guys. You know, like yeah, why yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is a lot of kids, you know, they see their the the their, their real dad, right, or their real mom. You know, mm -hmm. in in public, everybody like respects this guy or whatever, and this and that. But the kids like, oh but he oh. yells at me or he gets mad at me yeah. or at home. He doesn't have good care, you know? Right. So, yeah. So then they're like, well, what are you preaching? You're just a hypocrite and this and that. And that can cause somebody's heart to, you know, go away from Islam. May Allah protect us, man. They're all mean, trials. I think luck. that's, that's probably a little bit for me. That's more unfair because I, yeah. I completely understand not that I like beat my kids or anything. Right. But I understand yeah. the idea and notion of the fact that, look, I'm trying my best to yeah. educate and preach and do something. I may not do, I may not even practice everything I tell you, but it doesn't mean I don't think it's right. It doesn't mean that yeah. I, I like, who better to tell you not to smoke than a guy who's like, you know, on his, like, what are those breathing things called? You know, where yeah. he's like on his last yeah, breath. Yeah. Like, someone yeah. might not be in a position to always practice everything they preach, but it doesn't yeah. deter them from actually saying the truth and then yeah. preaching the facts. I always, but I, I, like I said about the imam and his daughter, like I, that's one thing that I always like pray for, like Allah, don't humiliate me. Like don't allow my legacy to be tainted by, you know, or, 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 or don't allow me to be humiliated by maybe the people who will come after me or, or, you yeah. know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so kind and like, he, you know, he hides our sins from people and he like protects us from so much. Yeah. But, you know, like you said, like he dies from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never know you know, yeah. what, what your kids might turn out as. And there's this old saying, um, when you're wearing a, a, an all white kameez, like an all white shirt, like the smallest stain stands out. Mm. Right. So it's like when you put somebody on the microscope, the smallest things would be like, ah, look at that. You yeah. know, as opposed to somebody whose shirt's all dirty and stuff, he gets another stain. People won't even care. That's why I only wear black. I don't even wear white. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't trust white. I, too much pressure. You know the problem with black though? I've had this problem with black now. Especially because mm. I'm doing like uh, more recordings and online stuff and like getting lint on, on black stuff. That stands uh -oh. out. Man. So I can see some lint on your shirt, man. Can you? You, you got to get a lint roller to take care I, of that. If I had the HD on it, if I didn't have the HD, it would have been fine. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why. I always like dark. And of course, like Prophet Sallam used to wear white thobes. And we all, but yeah. I, I actually like, I don't know if this is even like correct to say, but I don't, I despise wearing white because I'm always yeah. so conscious of the fact that 
If I drop anything on it, that's it. It's game over. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like I gotta change immediately. Like I don't trust my, I don't trust myself around. I don't believe in myself enough to wear white. Like I, I'm the same. I'm the same way. I like darker colors. I wear a lot of black. And look, and that by the way, that's a little bit misunderstood by people when they say Prophet you know, wore white. He loved white. Absolutely, he loved white and he wore white. But he didn't only wear white. He wore yeah. other colors as well. But mm-hmm. he did like white. So I always tell people like to implement the sunnah every now and then try to like wear something that's white. Like at least like Juma or Eid or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Wear something that's white because Prophet loved white. So yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I showed up on the day of my nikah with a, a, a dark blue thobe. <laughs> and my dad and my father-in-law sent me back home to get a white thobe. No way. I kid you not. Wow. I was like, in my head, I'm like, well, like I look good. Like I, I was, I look like, fly. I was wearing, What's the problem? Yeah, I was wearing a nice thobe, and they both. And this is mind you, they don't even know each other that well. Like this is <laughs> literally the day, like well, they met each other maybe a few times, but this is the day where it's like we're sealing the deal. And they both unanimously were like, "Yeah, you gotta change." Wow. And I was like, "Damn!" I'm like, "This whole system is set up against me, man. Like, these, guys don't even know, these guys don't even know each other, and they're working against me." You know? But when when are you gonna wow. start recording this? Recording one. Oh, did you already start recording this thing? We we've, we've been recording, dude. Allah Akbar. So you think <laughs> I gotta look good, man? You didn't tell me I got lint on me. I got. Yo, I just threw this on because this is a Zoom so, call. So, I told you I gotta wear pants. The- <laughs> you know, people be people be at home just in their underwear because they don't have they don't have no expectations. So, so the whole point of this is to be as casual as normal as possible. Uh, uh, it, like it's not scripted it's just i want people to see a normal co- like so you know i've I've done this uh you know i'll, I'll send you some links but like i've d- I've called other people um and i no, want I people saw, to see I the- saw you did one i thought you i saw, I yeah. saw you doing one with amar actually i think there were amar uh Sheikh Yahya ibrahim i did one uh Sheikh majid um mm-hmm. and and others. i just want people to to see like how we in- interact normally right like the real life interaction and mm-hmm. uh you know, maybe get some benefit out. Maybe if not, you know, just. Oh, I yeah. That's we... why. That's why you're like. Wait, you're. I didn't want to like give too much away. I was like, yo, I just, I, I want to call you. Want to talk to you. I thought you were just that's gonna it. call me on the phone. I didn't even know it was gonna be. I first of all, I didn't know yeah. it, was, it was gonna be Zoom, <laughs> and I didn't know you were recording it. That's how you know this is really casual. I didn't even know it was happening. <laughs> there you go. Thought, there you go. Authentic I thought you were experience. checking up on me because you because you loved me, and then I realized I do oh, love you, guy, Habibi. This guy wants I do love you. I'm like, oh. no, man. I want people to see that I no, love I'm you. Kidding. I'm just kidding. No, Alhamdulillah. Cool. Alhamdulillah. That's good. Man. Zakallah so, khair, man. Family's good. Everyone's good. Otherwise, Alhamdulillah. Everyone's doing well. Uh, kids are doing well. Family's doing well. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. How about, how about on your end? Now, yeah, everyone's good. So Leith is what five years old now? Leith is five. Sufyan is uh, one and a half. One and a half. That's a good age, man. I miss those. Uh, is it? It's a crazy age, man. Terrible twos are coming up. Yeah. It's, my, it's my getting son pretty is, wild. My son is uh, going from JK. No. Going from SK to grade one. What's SK? Oh, man. That's the American education system right there. Uh, is it like kindergarten? Kindergarten, right? Yeah. You have like junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten. Oh, what do you guys God. have? We just have kindergarten. You we, have have pre, we have pre-K. You have yeah, gun we academy. Have... <laughs> <laughs> we have boot camp at, at five years old. Sign them up. No, we have, no, we pre- have preschool. Preschool is like four years old. That's like when you're four. And so there's pre-K and then there's KG, kindergarten. That's KG it. KG is how many years? Kind- one year. Oh, that's why you guys are like that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, of course. We don't like to waste, we don't like to waste taxpayers' money. We're not going to waste our time and send our kids to school. There's an army that you're filling. <laughs> There's a Starbucks that needs baristas. Let's get them out of the workforce. You know, I was the first, my year was the first year that didn't have grade 13. Okay. In Ontario. So we actually used to have a 13th grade, which was actually designed to help students like, you know, like people take that leap year, like after high school, yeah. they don't know what to do. So it was like a built-in leap year where yeah. you took like less of a workload. You you did some like uh, co-ops and stuff like that. Yeah. You got a little work experience. And that was actually in the education system, but they, they, I was the first year that they didn't in, include that. See, that's the that's problem with Canada, man. Y'all too soft. What is this? Well, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm part of the We're system like, now. 12th grade, boom, off to college. Figure life out. Never mind career. that. Your whole in life America, depends on this. In America, you can join the army before you can drink alcohol. Yeah, yeah. You can legally kill people on a payroll 
but they don't trust you enough to have a beverage of alcohol. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is a bit like, yeah. not to say it's a great thing. Like, yeah, you should have, you know, lower yeah, drinking yeah. needs, but no, it's of like, course, of course. it's like, it's a bit strange. Don't you think like we're America is like, a, America's a strange place, man. <laughs> what's too old? What's too young? Like you gotta make up your mind. Like, it's really arbitrary. A lot of times it's so arbitrary. Somebody decided this age and they went with it and became law. And then that's just how things. And now, and now there's the, there's the red and blue and the black and white camps and people are ride or die about it. It's like, yeah. Yeah, everything is, everything is right or die here, man. You're either for it or against it. Yeah. You know, none of that weak sauce middle stuff. Oh, oh, yeah, democracy stuff. Oh, you're compassionate? You can empathize with the other person? Get out of here. There's no room yeah. for you. Uh, that's funny, man. I, 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 in many ways, you know, so strange as a Canadian, I always felt more American. It's probably because, like, a lot of our media is American, and we have, like, yeah. I had a lot of American influence stuff growing up. Even, like, when I go to the U.S., I I can easily blend in. Like I don't feel like I have the the temperament of like a Canadian. Like I I, I know when to ask for something that's yeah. mine. I, like I can act like that if I need to. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. but it's just funny. Like when you come back to Canada, I, then I feel like in Canada I'm overly aggressive sometimes. Like, people, like <laughs> they're not expecting me. Like I show up and I'm like, you know, like or somebody messes up an order. I'm not a jerk or anything, but like yeah, I, I don't let people walk over me. You know, like and, and yeah. I think Americans are like that in general. Yeah. Americans they understand the idea of like, this is my right. I have the right to do yeah. it. It's a very privileged and like, it's definitely like a spoiled worldview, like that you it, it's in, you feel entitled to everything. But yeah. in many ways, like you're right. Like certain things yeah. are, you, like, that's, that's your hop. Like you, you do deserve to have certain things done a certain way. So one of the positives of that is that in general, we have great customer service. Oh yeah, yeah, 100%. And you realize it, like I realize it when I go to other parts of the world. Yeah. Like going to Europe, going to the UK, like, I just, I, you know, I guess it's my entitlement as an American, but like, I'm like, wait, what is wrong with the customer service here? Uh, yeah. Why are there you not no, accommodating? There is no customer service. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a thing. phone. It's a, it's a phone yeah. and you have to like punch in buttons Yeah. and there's no one to talk to. Yeah. In the US, you can talk to someone at, six, at 3 a.m. Yeah. You'll get a, a lady in the Philippines who will answer any question you have. <laughs> and the company's done it because they value your business, right? Like they understand yeah. that if you're not satisfied, yeah. you're going to go somewhere else. That's yeah. a byproduct of like capitalism, right? Because that's yeah. the economy. But yeah. I guess in other places where that's not the emphasis, yeah. they're not as aggressive with it. So definitely I see that as, as a, a something uniquely American. And that's actually a really good thing, like customer service, people yeah. knowing that if you, the whole like Yelp world, like it came from America. Like, you know, if yeah. this restaurant does me bad, I don't yeah. just got to like take it in, in, in quiet. Like I can yeah. tell people, like, I can share and that restaurant then in turn realizes like, damn, we got to step it up. Cause if yep. you know, people can really, we can lose yeah. our business that way. It's a good thing. Alhamdulillah. But you know, people take that to the extreme as well. We got the whole yeah. Karen, Karen culture now, you know, oh, feel Uber entitled. So, by the way, I'm you know. so happy about like all this Karen exposure. And <laughs> I wrote a poem, by the way, I wrote a poem. You're like, I even, I've been dealing with Karen my whole life. Oh, Y'all just I, now finding out I'm, about it. I, I am kid you not. I've been dealing with crazy white women for so many years. I can remember being like probably maybe in grade like seven or eight. And I had a, a, a teacher who asked me, uh, do your parents hit you? She was upset at me. She, she wanted to get me in trouble for something. And she wanted to tell my parents. And she asked me, do your parents hit you? And I was like thinking she'd be sympathetic. I'm like, yeah, they do. And she's like, all right, great. What's their number? And I'm like, damn. You really my arch nemesis, dude. I'm 12 years old. What's wrong with you? Like, wow. like these women were really out to get me, and I I remember living in a in a reality where like I wasn't so much scared of white men as I were of like white women who had that power, who had that ability, wow. those crocodile tears that could like ruin your life. You know, they they know. cry and the cavalry come running. I I wrote a poem about it. I I wrote a poem about it. One of the examples I brought up was the Emmett Till case, right? Yeah. And the, that lady was a class. She was like the first Karen, the woman who you know claimed that Emmett Till. Looked looked at her a certain way or whatever yeah. like and years later we found out she recanted her statement and said yeah. no that actually didn't happen is your poem online is it on youtube i, I haven't i haven't released it yet i i wrote it oh, during i was gonna post a link thing. i was gonna post no a link. no no i'm just i'm giving you the inside scoop you know what i'm saying all right, all right, you, you all right. Know cool, cool, yeah, cool, cool, i wrote cool. it because like as this whole karen thing was unfolding i had yeah. so much to say about it like i'm like yeah. oh, wow this is to me it's and it's such a such a weapon now your phone has become so weaponized like anytime yeah. somebody you don't have to even record so somebody just start yeah. acting crazy you just gotta start doing this yeah. and immediately <laughs> it's like a tuck one chart like it's like you just oh sorry I, I forgot where i was like you know like people just they grow sense they just grow yeah. common sense in like two seconds it's, it's fantastic i love it i've been noticing like even in my area when um like a cop has somebody pulled over 
like people actually drive by and they'll slow down now to yeah. look like is it a person of color like who is oh, it yeah. and like some people and so now i mean that's a good thing that cops feel like you know they have to you know yeah, be on their best behavior yeah, yeah. that's accountability that. right that's the only way because yeah. obviously we don't trust them i mean i don't know if you've been following this whole uh this is a random off topic but you've been following the whole uh recent raptors fiasco with the general manager of the raptors who no, no, what happened the, uh, so after the when when Toronto won the championship last, I know you're from DC. Do you guys have a team yeah. there still, Washington? Of do course we do. We oh, got right. the Wizards, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Allah, Wizards. Uh, I know, I know. They're a whack team. So much I, I can that. say. Oh. I'm not in the sports, but I know that yeah, the Wizards yeah. are a whack team. Anyways, so after Toronto won the championship last year in Golden State, the general manager, who's actually he's African, he's from Nigeria. His name is Masai Ujiri. He attempted to walk on court with his, like he had his credentials in his pocket and he's going to show the, and there's a security guard who was actually a uniformed officer. And this officer saw this black man walking with a suit and immediately like shoved him and started swearing. And and the entire time this last year, the officer said that this man approached him aggressively, pushed him and he was actually counter suing for like, um, like he said that he suffered like, you know, mental, emotional like, distress. Emotional distress. And yeah. he had, the, cause he realized afterwards that this guy has deep pockets, right? Not just him, the organization he represents. Yeah. He was kind of yeah. And they just released the body cam footage like probably two, three days ago. And mm. it is like literally the exact opposite of what this man said. He was the aggressor. He put, this is the, the general manager. He's like the oh, highest man. position. Oh, the general manager. Wow. Yeah, but wow. he's the highest position there is, right? Wow. Imagine if, if this guy, imagine how many of those circumstances happen on a daily basis without yeah access to Absolutely. lawyers like he had without access yeah. to you know fame and publicity like that is like a daily occurrence for so many people like i've always felt like that i've been scared yeah. of police my entire life i never had a good interaction with police my entire life i don't even know if a cop's like if i if i was lost i wouldn't even ask a cop for directions i don't want him to think i'm, I'm plotting you know like i don't even i don't even take a chance and some people found that weird but like i just thought that was normal like that's because that doesn't that's not a reality for some people right so they can't understand that like yeah, a yeah, lot of people yeah. live their life in a way it's like, well, I, that's not real for me. So it's not real. The hardest part you know? about it actually is trying to teach like my five-year-old son, like, how do you, what do you teach him about like law enforcement? My son, you know, like five, four years old, he's like, oh, I want to be a police officer. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> give it about a year or so. That <laughs> thing is gonna change real quick, right? I don't know if you'll survive, son. I don't know. Yeah. Right. But then it's like, at, at a certain point, I have to teach him like, okay, now you're a threat. Yeah. Now you're not cute. The anymore. default, the default is you're a threat. Yeah. You're a threat. I, I got to yeah. teach him at some point. And that to me is like, because we're having like, even my kids, you know, especially with this whole stay at home thing, like your kids hear things, they learn things, yeah. they hear your conversations with your wife, whatever. So a lot of this, you know, black lives matter stuff that my kids have been asking, yeah. we've been talking, we've been explaining to them about racism and how anti-black racism works and, and what are some of the things. And we actually had an incident. My kids are going to a day camp right now. Mm-hmm. And they had an incident when one of the kids said that my son uh, looked like a monkey. So I go the next morning, come yeah. to find out the kid who said it is half black himself. There are some deeper things going. He has some self hate. Wow. Like the kid is talking about black people and he's black. He looks black. Yeah. And I'm like, how yeah. are you racist? Like that's why we got racism in the Muslim community, right? You're being discriminated against and then, you know, racism is rampant. It was just, like, for me, it was so sad because I'm like, I'm like, man, you have it. You have it worse than my son. Like, yeah, you might make fun of my son, but secretly you make fun of yourself. Like yeah. secretly you say those things, but you actually, you mean them about you. Yeah. Like that. That's, that's, that's such a, at such a young age, you know, he's that's learned the power to. Of, like anti-black racism. Like you can actually legit hate yourself. And I mean, not just anti-black, we know how colorism works. We know yeah. Yeah. why skin, skin, skin bleaching is a huge industry. Why, yeah. you know, so many young girls are taught like, you know, to be lighter yeah. shade and, yeah. It's all nonsense. That's why I only wear black. That's why I keep telling people. That's why I don't even wear black. <laughs> I, I, I ain't trying to deal with all that drama. You know what I'm saying? I just keep it regular. That's it. But like, it's, it's sad, you know? And, and on top of this whole like quarantine and stay at home thing, and I, it's good in a way, but having to explore those realms, like with your children in society, like even in the Muslim community, I did a lot of stuff, you know, right after the whole George Floyd thing, you know, everyone was quick. Like you said, they were quick to talk about racism. Yeah. yeah. I did like a ton of panels. And I did them with people that I know, and I know they had good intentions, but I'm, I'm there to yeah. help and support. Like, I'm, I, obviously, I, I want to help, you know, even broader people's understanding of certain topics. Yeah. But I couldn't help but think, like, is it really, like, this is what it took for you guys to acknowledge or, or think or care about certain things? Like, like I was here all along. Like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> like, it's not my first time showing up to the dance, you know? Like, I've been here. 
Yeah, and I've I've heard that from a lot of people, man. Like, oh, now you care. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now it, you want to give me a platform. Now you want me to come speak at your event, yeah. and you know. I mean, that's why I always value like, and this is not like a selfless plugger, but like I'm looking for example, like to me was an organization that before it was like, before you needed the color quota, like, yeah. you know, there are, there are certain organizations that were yeah. real about, like they understood yeah. like, you know, this is what it is. We are really upon like, yeah. that was, you know, like we want to yeah. engage communities and people. And that's why yeah. I always appreciated like those organizations and, and communities that made space for those conversations before this yeah. whole thing happened. Yeah. It's like after the fact is like I don't know, man. Your your intentions are a bit fishy. Like it seems yeah. too convenient that all of a sudden you care about this topic. Like if yeah, it was organic. It before, yeah, if it, if it was organic and you yeah. genuinely provided spaces and opportunities and platforms to have discussions about race and discrimination before this whole yeah. thing, I rate you. Like I, I can see, you know, yeah. that you were genuine. But afterwards, I'm like uh, a little bit too late. Even I like you know, especially when I, when I started working for the Muslim, one of the things that I appreciated was that, you know, they didn't just hire people because they're popular, right? Yeah. You know, uh, especially like my time, my generation is like, they wanted to like help speakers and develop them. And, you know, they saw potential, um, they helped them grow. And that to me was like a sign, like a really good sign. I was know? there at your first uh, Elm Fest talk. You remember that yeah. in Toronto? Yeah, Toronto, yeah. I remember 2012. that. Oh, yeah, yeah I, was there. I introduced you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I introduced YQ and then YQ introduced you. No, you introduced. I introduced Mohammed Sharif. Mohammed Sharif. Oh, Mohammed Sharif oh, introduced me. Yeah. Okay. Mohammed Sharif. But he, somebody. I've known Mohammed Sharif for a long time. He's like he was my guy. Oh um, right, right, right. You guys had the like the DMV connection. You know him back then as well. Yeah, yeah. That's why. That's that's how I knew him. Oh, um, I see. I knew him. I knew him when Al Maghrib started. You were you were the in, original. In you were the original buddy buddy driver. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You were the original. You had the badge. You exactly. had the itinerary. Exactly. Except back then we had nothing. Oh, it was yeah. like it was mad chill. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. Imagine like before cell. Phone. Was that no? That wasn't like before cell phone. Was, uh, it? was it? It was actually not every. Actually, not everyone had a cell phone. Cell phones yeah, were it wasn't there, but yeah, yeah. How did, how did people? How did people get anywhere? You know, I remember going. I had a. I had a map of all the massages in Toronto. I used yeah. to do this thing. Like I used to pray. 30 different masajid in Ramadan, just for fun, you know, like in my area. In Toronto, yeah. alhamdulillah, we have a lot of masajid. And yeah. I used to have a paper map that yeah. I used to follow. And I'm like, how the heck did I get to these places without a GPS? <laughs> I couldn't, like, imagine a map. Do you even know what a map looks like nowadays? Like, could you imagine f driving and following a map? That was crazy. Do yeah. you remember MapQuest? Did you ever do MapQuest? I, I'm, I'm telling you, you have to print, print out, out the directions. directions <laughs> yeah. And you have to, like, look, imagine texting and driving now is dangerous. Before I yeah. had a book. I had, yeah. a, I had a whole sheet of paper. I had my whole windshield was covered in paper and I was driving. And you didn't think yeah. that was problematic? Yeah. Like now just me touching Google is not an issue. Like I, I lived through much worse eras. Like, yeah, printing out the map and then yeah. you miss an exit and you're like, all right, I guess I, I live here. What now. do I do? Exactly. Yeah. I just you have to figure it out. I have to start a life here now. I don't know how to get back. <laughs> you know, it's funny, right? Right when the whole Corona thing started, a lot of things were getting canceled and I kind of saw the writing in the in the wall. I'm like, all right, you know, Things are going to get shut down really soon. Yeah. And at that time, flight tickets started, you remember like flight tickets started going down like crazy. Like from Toronto, you can go to, you can go to Mexico for like 150 bucks. Yep. Yeah. And for a minute, I, I, I kid you not, I told my wife, I'm like, man, I think we should do it. <laughs> plan like an impromptu vacation, like two weeks. We found Airbnb, we searched Airbnbs. We found them like, I'm talking like, we were even taking, uh, you know, Corona considerations. Like we were finding like villas. Yeah. And you can find super cheap villas. And we were like, yeah. find a villa, just stay there. And then we were like hesitant. And then we were like, okay, let's not do it. It's our, we talked to our families and they're like, no, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Right after that, they shut down the borders. So I was telling my home, like, man, we, we dodged a bullet. Yeah, you would have been stuck. We would have been Mexican by now. We would have just had to start it. I would have just been Pablo Muhammad. Just I guess, started <laughs> why you, life. in this in this hypothetical, why are you changing your name? I I, I gotta blend in. I got I gotta I don't wanna draw attention. I gotta just my son would have just started speaking Spanish. We just would have been different people. Like Yo, that's I, what's I, up, man. Just, yeah, I remember when they were closing down the borders. I don't know if you remember, like there was a rumor or like you know, they were closing down the borders. Like people weren't allowed to come back to America or something. Yeah, yeah. And like the airports are flooded and it's just, it's going insane. It reminded me of like, that scene from Home Alone where like just running in the airport. I can just yeah. imagine every family just left a kid somewhere. Like, yeah. There's a kid yeah. at a terminal right now because they just were in such a panic. Yeah. And by the way, the Americans are the ones that we're worried about right now. Like, have you seen the Canadian? You American should be. Border? You oh, should be. God. 
and Canadians are like so big on this because I think there's a lot of schools, like you know, especially in places like Michigan where people just yeah. you know cross the border, it's nothing for them. Yeah, yeah. But like it's like proper xenophobia now. Like American Canadians are like, dude, <laughs> don't let like don't let these guys in. Like we don't know what Yo, they have. I don't blame you. Know? you. I don't blame you. Keep the Americans out, man. We're talking Give about building us a wall. Taste of our own medicine. Listen, I don't want to sell you. We're, we're talking about building a wall, okay? I don't want to tell you guys. Do it. Do it, man. Do it. I mean, it might have to be done. It might be an ice wall. I don't know how it would work, but <laughs> we'd have to invest time into. Um, <laughs> Took a lot of your time, man. But you started recording. Head, yeah, man. I told you I was only going to be available for 15 minutes, but somehow. You're like, yeah, I got 15 up. minutes. I'm like, all right, well, we'll see. I haven't talked to this my, guy in like ages. I know. My kids are waiting for me. I was supposed to play with them right now and stuff, but that's fine. Oh, man. I'll have more oh, kids in school. I'm doing that. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone this long. So maybe we'll do, I'll do like a part one, part two. And you might have to. Inshallah. Inshallah. And explain to people why you don't talk to anyone else for long. They should <laughs> explain your, uh, your uh, introverted ways as well. <laughs> you yeah, want to get yeah, it out absolutely. as quick as possible. Hey, oh, so where you go, man? Are we yeah, still yeah. doing this? <laughs> oh, oh. I, there's no you realize else. you're on camera? You realize you're being recorded? I know. I just saw, you know what? I never know when this red thing is on, like on Zoom. <laughs> Yo, you got to watch out for the red thing. I'm telling man. you. I'm telling you. I realized that actually. People saw, I was in a meeting not long ago and it was actually at the end of the meeting, I realized it was being recorded and I was like, whoa. Yeah, I should have yeah, worn careful. Pants. I did this with Nevaid too. We had to do like a fake setup. That's the only thing fake about that whole video was that setup. That's why he starts laughing halfway through the setup. <laughs> yeah, he's bad. He, he can't play along. He's not, he's not a good actor. All right, man. Uh, Zakallah Khair, I appreciate you taking so much Zakallah time. Zakallah Khair, Sheikh. Thank you very much for. Oh. <laughs> All right, you, know, you want me to sing for that? <laughs> this is like those charades games. Remember we used to play those in Elm Fest? Yeah, that? yeah. yeah you um, guys are all bad at them. Oh, I'm just kidding. Okay, do your thing. I'm just playing with you. Barakallah feekum. Hope all is well with you, family, and everyone at home, inshallah. Hopefully, we'll get back to normal life soon, inshallah. We'll be able inshallah. to uh, share a stage inshallah. once again, inshallah. Inshallah. Looking forward to it, man. Take care. Zakallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.